Hello, and welcome to The Unique CPA with your host, Randy Crabtree. The goal of our show is to keep you at the forefront of the changing face of public accounting by having conversations with fascinating leaders and bringing you their stories, insights, and advice. The Unique CPA podcast is brought to you by Trimerit, the specialty tax professionals. Today, our guest is Matthew May. Matthew is one of the co-founders of Acuity, which is a cloud accounting service. Uh, I'll let him expand on that a little more, but we're here today. We're going to mainly talk about crypto. Crypto is a huge topic. Crypto, everybody has questions about. Not many people have answers. Matthew is the guy with the answers. So we're going to talk about crypto today with Matthew. Matthew, welcome to the Unique CPA. Oh, thanks for having me. I sure appreciate it. Yeah, no, this is a topic I've been asked a lot about getting a podcast done on. Uh, in fact, I got uh, some, oh, the producers just asked me two days ago, I think, or three days ago, and then your name came up. I go, okay, let's get this recorded. And, and you were gracious enough to get this uh, set up right away. So I appreciate it. Uh, before we get into crypto, why don't you give me a little background on, on you and Acuity, just so we know what, the, what this is all, what you're all about. Well, I'm a recovering auditor. Started out, you know, uh, a big, uh, big four. Uh, it wasn't big four back at the time. It was big six. Um, so you always date people by what they say, right? So I, yeah, I started I'm big, out big, I'm big eight. I started at big eight area. So you, so you're even you're younger than me. So, so I, I, I beat you by a, a nose there. And then uh, you can really always get it when they say the big five, because that's like a, you can get guess people's age within like two year. Range. Yeah, so I think it was all of a year and a half that it was the big five, but I started in the big six, uh, uh, made it all the way to partner at a top 25 firm uh, on the audit practice. And then um, I jumped off that train about nine years ago and joined Kenji at Acuity. Acuity had been a, a CFO advisory practice for the first nine years. And I uh, had a couple of controllers and Kenji and I had talked about converting it into a, also a cloud accounting business. So I bought out, functionally bought out his partner and, and we kind of launched uh, what is now uh, the new Acuity about nine years ago. And we've been doing it nine years, about five years ago. You know, we specialize in SaaS and technology about five years ago. One of our technology clients was like, hey, we just made this new cryptocurrency and we don't know what to do with it. They had done a token sale. So they raised 25 million bucks by printing money. But uh, you know, part of that, they didn't issue all the tokens they, they had. They kept 80%. So they had this huge treasury. They had, they had a bunch of cash in the bank. They had a bunch of Bitcoin, a bunch of Ethereum, a bunch of cash, a bunch of their own crypto. And, and they're like, here you go. Uh, what do I do now? <laughs> um, so the nice thing is they had money and they had good intentions. So we used uh, Deloitte from a tax perspective. And I functioned as their CFO for almost four years. Deloitte from a tax perspective, per Perkins and Cooey from a uh, legal perspective. And I really cut my teeth and under got got like the best minds, you know, to, to kind of come together to understand all the consequences. And then we dealt with all kinds of fun stuff, like how do you get your W-2 wages on a Gusto? Or like they were using Gusto for payroll. How do you get your W-2 wages uh, stated correctly? And then we had that and several other things. How do you create treasury so people don't get kidnapped because you have a half billion dollars and you don't want people to get kidnapped? Like, how do you deal with that issue? Like wow. uh, lots of fun issues. Uh, got some great travel stories too about the British Virgin Islands and the Cayman Islands and having to hand my passport to a sh shipboat captain because customs was closed and he needed us to go through and that kind of stuff. So it's, 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 it's kind of like the wild, wild west. It's, it's I know, as fun yeah. as people say. Yeah. So, so you've already confused me on everything. I have no idea what's going on here because <laughs> crypto in general confused. I own some crypto. I don't get it. I don't understand. Well, let's start there. Cause you started talking about, they created this token. They didn't sell everything. I don't even what's a token. How is there any value to that? I don't even understand this. Uh, can you give me some basics on yeah. what a crypto is? Yeah. So that, that's a great question. And, and the answer to that question is like, there's like, you know, probably like a thousand meaningful cryptocurrencies, but like there's probably 10 or 20,000 cryptocurrencies out there, but a thousand of any merit, maybe even 150 of any merit. Uh, you can look at coin market cap if you want to see all of them and you can see all the pricing and stuff like that. And the first kind of 150 have some, some validity. But um, the interesting thing about cryptocurrency when you're trying to explain it to people 
is that it's not all the same thing. So that's the first thing I'll tell you. Yeah. Like a cryptocurrency is not all the same thing. And it's dynamic. So we, we hired an economist at this client and he advised the Federal Reserve and he wrote a white paper about cryptocurrency and he talked about how it would behave differently. And there's kind of a 50% rule. So cryptocurrency is basically, people talk about the 50% rule on the control side, like you can control a cryptocurrency if you own 50% of it. But there's also a behavior if 50% of the people are using cryptocurrency for a certain thing, it becomes that certain thing. So let's talk about what thing people think of, of cryptocurrency is about. Because there's like a couple of categories. Yes. First, they talk about it like it, like, like you think of dollars and yes. cash, like a payment mechanism. We'll call it a payment mechanism. So there are some cryptocurrencies that are attempting to be payment mechanisms. There's USD coins. So there's coins that mimic the US dollar. They call them like stable coins because they don't fluctuate. There's coins like Bitcoin Cash, a version it originally started as Bitcoin, but it's a version of Bitcoin. There's a couple of other ones, but Bitcoin Cash and the stable coins are primary ones that I think of as ones that are trying to mimic currencies or payment mechanisms. And what they focus on is low transaction fees and speed to delivery, right? So they're trying to mimic try to beat because their competition is credit cards, right? Yep. The second major category is what most people default to because Bitcoin's in this category is a store of value. So think of a store of value, an example of that is gold, right? So in, in our economy, gold is a store of value. So you don't go to the store and pay for stuff with gold usually, right? Right. Theoretically, you could Theoretically, with Bitcoin, you could pay with stuff, but its function, what over 50% of the users are doing with it, is holding it as a store of value, right? Yep. Is that fair? It's fair. I just don't know where the value is. What created the value? Well, the same thing could be said for gold, right? Okay. Because the utility of gold is not really driving the value of gold. Okay. Like how people use gold is not driving the value of gold because people are using it more for storing value than they are for its utility. Okay. Right? Yep. Is that fair? Yes. See, part, big part of the show is just educating me, all the unique CPA shows. So this is good. You're educating me. Let's keep going. Oh, so we've got, <laughs> so we've got a currency. Yep. We've got a store of value. Then we have some that are just technology solutions. So one that came out called Ripple is trying to replace the SWIFT system in the banking. Wasn't Ripple a while ago? I think I remember hearing that eight years ago or something. Yeah, yeah. It was real popular a few years ago. Yep. Then the other biggest category I see is on these tokens. They mimic gift cards, basically. Okay. They're almost like gift cards. Or the other thing they, they are similar to is Kickstarter campaigns. Yep. Because their ultimate use is to buy the product that they're trying to fund. But it's kind of like a... Kickstarter slash gift card campaign, right? Yep. And that's what they can start out as. Now, if anybody starts using them for something else, then that's a that that's what it is. So cryptocurrencies in general, over 50% of the users for the last, like I would say, up until about two years ago, we're using them solely for speculation. Yep. So they're just speculative assets at that point. Now, some of them are starting to emerge where more people are using them for store value. Like Bitcoin, when the institutionals came into Bitcoin, that gave Bitcoin more characteristics of a store of value than a speculative asset, even though I don't know what you consider the institutionals. They're pretty, they're crazy ass okay. people too, if you look at the stock market. But Bitcoin is now behaving more similar to a stock in the stock market or store of value, yep. like gold, than they are like a really, really speculative asset. Yep. Okay. It still has a high beta, but you'd have to give to me that it's behaving that way. So th that's how I start with people. It's not all the same thing yep. from that perspective. And the weird thing is it has the characteristic is if the people who own it, the most of them change how they use it, it can change between those categories. Right. Okay. I'm catching up. It's going to take a while, but I'm catching up. So let me ask a question about Bitcoin then, because at one point, Elon Musk, the car company, why is my mind blank? Uh, uh, Tesla. Tesla. 
was accepting Bitcoin for payment for cars. I think they just did that for a short time. Right. So they were using Bitcoin as a cash then. Not They weren't using Bitcoin cash or were they? Were they using Bitcoin? Is that what they, they were using? They were accepting Bitcoin as payments. They were. OK. But that's not really like if you look at what Tesla owns Bitcoin for is for a store of value. Right. It's a hedge against government currencies. It's a hedge against U.S. inflation, all those kind of things. OK. Right. So you can and people do try to use it as a payment mechanism. But it's just like trying to pay for something. Like if you went to a Tesla store and said, I want to buy something in Apple stock. Right. That's what I was thinking. They, they might do it. Right? right. They may be like, sure, uh -huh. give me 12 shares. But it's going to be like a one off. There's not going to be a system for it. There's going to be some work around random. Right. Stuff, right. Yep. So. OK. All right. So that, that gives me an idea. I, I appreciate that information you gave there because that helps me get my mind around. That. I'm guessing listeners as well or listener. I think we have one listener. So that one listener is helping them as well. Well, you got two because my mom will listen now. <laughs> right. So you're so, like, all right, so nice. listen to this one episode. <laughs> That's nice. All right. Hi, mom. Thanks for listening. Um, I'll get my mom to listen too. So we'll have three. Look no, at, look at three. us. All right. Actually, seriously, we've added a ton of listeners. So I think we do have more than one, which is really nice. And thank you, everybody, for listening. All right, on with the show. So now we've got the base idea. Okay, this is what's out there. There's obviously still a lot of questions in my head. All right, now we got tax and accounting issues. I think tax to me seems pretty straightforward. If it's a, you know, an investment, I sell it for gain. I got capital gains. I sell it for loss. I got capital loss. Are there tax issues that within this I'm not thinking of? Well, um, that, that kind of takes us to a, a, a kind of a tangential topic <laughs> right. is uh, kind of the regulatory ecosystem. If nobody believes me that they can be different things. So uh, the regulatory agencies consider these different things as well. So that's where a lot of the complexities where people get scared about them. The CFTC calls these commodities, cryptocurrencies. The SEC calls them securities. FinCEN is trying to call it a uh, currency and the IRS calls it property. Right. But other than that, it's really straightforward. <laughs> All right. All right. So this is an evolving thing. So, but like at the end of the day for the, the tax folks out there, you know, they, they already know this because they're familiar with the 89, 49 or anybody. Cryptocurrency is like, if you want to take on a cryptocurrency client, it's like taking on a day trader in the nineties and two thousands. Yep. Like it's the same kind of problem, except the day trader can pay for stuff with his stock <laughs> and it still has the same accounting or they could trade stock for stock and that creates a cap gain and loss and you don't get carry over basis. So you get, you have all these transactions with people that are like, no, I just converted Ethereum to Bitcoin. I didn't sell my cryptocurrency. Well, that's a sale in the eyes of the IRS. Right. So you're host. Yeah. Right. All right. So from that standpoint, how about all these regulatory authorities? How's that affected? Everybody has a different idea of what a crypto is. Right. How do you deal with that? Is that an accounting issue? Is it a tax issue? Is it all issue? It tends to be an operational issue for your clients that want to deal with it. Okay. Right. So especially if you issue a cryptocurrency, like there's just no guidance because the regulatory authorities in the U.S. just don't agree with each other. And that's just the U.S., oh, by right. the way. Okay. <laughs> All right. Because <laughs> most of these companies that issue cryptocurrencies are global, but um, it's kind of funny. But that's why I spent some time in Cayman and BBI and, oh, really? and, and, and some of the other countries just to, because you have to, if you're going to have, well, I mean, if you have half a billion dollars worth of assets, you, it's worth expanding in, in, a, in a kind of international way. Right. That's great. What about financial statement reporting of this or accounting of it, what do we have to deal with there? So from a financial statement perspective, it's just very similar to inventory accounting. So you're, you're doing usually first in, first out inventory kind of style of accounting on each asset individually, tons of tracking issues, tons of problems. Cause if somebody like all the reporting isn't built for this. So if somebody sends it from their crypto wallet, to their Coinbase account. There's no system that allows you to have carryover basis or one system claims to be able to track it. Okay. You have to track the carryover basis. You got to do FIFO. What I found with my clients, what we've done, we focus a lot on focusing on business rules. 
like accepting crypto in one specific location so we can report and have a good FIFO and then transferring it to the treasury accounts, sending crypto for different purposes out of different wallets. And these are at big volumes. So one of my clients is a couple hundred thousand payments a month, you know, and they need to track and they want to know they wanted, they were like, okay, I've got 175,000 transactions over here that I put out that are micro payments, right? And then we, we want to track those in COGS. And we're like, well, you combine those with all your other payments, we're going to have to go through them onesie twosie. So we created a separate address that those come out of. So anything that goes out of that address, and we use a tool that we've been using for a long time called Legible, and it auto syncs to QuickBooks or Zero based on where the payment came from. Like you can track it and say, okay, all of these kinds of expenses, all payroll expenses come out of this address. And an address in crypto is like an account number. Okay. If you think of it from a bank, it's like having a payroll bank account, you know, like those old school ways we used to do that too, with like having a payroll bank account and a savings bank account. And right. So, yep, yep. so we've created those kind of mechanisms for people um, because you lose the bank feed data that we have in accounting. Uh, most of us, I think, are using lots of the bank feeds to pull data in right now. Well, you lose the vendor information and some of the other information, that, the data from the transaction. So we replace that with designated accounts. And you can track counterparties as well, but it, it at the volume that you're talking, it depends. They have to be pretty rigorous depending on how much their counterparties change if they want to track that. Okay, so in this scenario, you just said you were you were using you were tracking these micro transactions, and it was you know cog, so it was payments they were making for something. So every time there's a transaction, not only are you making a payment, but you've got a capital gain or loss too, right? Or am I right on that? That is correct. So that is one of the nuances that that happens. So for our book accounting for folks, what we do is we go ahead because the expense transaction or that COGS transaction is supposed to be recorded at that point in time at fair value. What we do is we record that and we don't try to record the gap gain and loss in each transaction. And then we do a balance sheet reconciliation to bring the balance sheet values back to FIFO. Okay. And then we flush the difference through crypto gain and loss instead of tracking it on a transaction by transaction basis. And this is for people with more than a hundred transactions a month or really more than 50 transactions a month, right? Okay. If you have 10 transactions, you can do the gain loss. If you got 200,000 transactions, you, you got to make some modifications. Yep. So we do the record the expense when it goes out. And then at the month in, we go back and do the FIFO reconciliation for the balance sheet accounts. So how much is in Bitcoin? And we do that, we figure out the units that are left, and then we go find out their cost basis based on the blockchain. And then some other data, we have a pricing tool that one of the tools, Legible, helps us. It has it in its tool so we can run a report and then we go from there. Okay. Well, that's what I was going to say. Are you creating an Excel spreadsheet for this or there's some behind the scenes technology? That uh, there's some behind the scenes technology, but I do heavy, heavy for the balance sheet reconciliations. They still end up in spreadsheets a lot of the times because- okay people don't always follow the business rules. I'm like, oh yeah, I bought this other one over here. So that's a one-off, right? Yeah. So, and because there's no lot tracking in a lot of the systems, it's it's just, uh, there's no silver bullet system yet. Okay. And the, you mentioned FIFO, do you have to do that? Can I go and just pick the highest cost basis and show that I'm doing a loss then? Or how? what's the FIFO for? So there's lots of discussion around in the tax community about that. Yeah. But for book, I think it's pretty clear it has to be FIFO. Okay. So if you're a gap reporter, yep. the way I read the AICPA practice aid is you kind of got to do FIFO. Now, the tax people, as you know, like to get cute. Uh -huh. Like, it, <laughs> I don't know how people do it, but some people do last in, first out. Some people do highest in, first out. Some people do first in, first out. And some people do specific identification in the tax realm. I think since we're trying to do it at scale, I think it's nuts to try to pick on a client-by-client okay. -client basis. So we do FIFO for ours okay, because we're trying to scale it and do it for multiples. Like, sure, for the one, if you're doing one or two of these, you can kind of get, I'll call get that getting cue with it. And some people will say, well, that's just good tax planning. Yeah. But at some point, you've got to build a system, right? Rather right. than manually putting this together. 
So I'm a big proponent of FIFO. I think it's the safest thing from a tax perspective as a policy election. Uh, but the aggressive people are definitely doing, I mean, highest in first out. Like, like to me, I'd rather be on the side of an audit where I've got FIFO than highest in first out. I'm just saying. I'm sure somebody will say, oh, but you can. I'm like, I, you tax people, do what you want to do. <laughs> yep. I'm trying to build a scalable process. No, I understand. That makes sense. The funny thing is, you know, my son and I were just talking about this yesterday or two days ago because he's got a lot of crypto and I know he's got some in Coinbase, but he also has some in his own wallet or whatever it is. But he did get a report and I know if it was from Coinbase or it's a subset of Coinbase, it was called Coinbase something else that was showing a loss on the sales for the year. And if it was FIFO, it would have shown a significant gain. So my guess is they were almost doing a LIFO version of this. Have you seen that? They might. I've seen a LIFO version. I've seen a specific identification version too. Yeah. Where like they lot track so they know which one you sold. Okay. So Coinbase has that data, but it's only for the Coinbase stuff. Usually clients that come to us have Coinbase plus this, plus this over here. And then they bought it over here and transferred over here. And like Coinbase can't run any reports, but Coinbase can't do crap for our clients. <laughs> no. Well, they're at, didn't they, didn't they have a big, uh, went public last year or something? Was that Coinbase or? Yeah, but they've got six different exchanges that don't even talk to each other. So okay. like, all right. They probably have more. They have more than that, actually. I know this because one of the platforms, Coinbase Commerce, doesn't talk to most of the tools right now. And that's the one a lot of the e com and the other people that are trying to use it in business are trying to use. Okay. It doesn't talk to any of the crypto tools. So it doesn't even help. Okay. So it sounds to me like there's confusion in account. Well, you got the you got the accounting part down. It sounds like pretty well the tax, you know, there's a little bit of a wild west. Well, maybe. I'll just I'll, I'll put this in accounting terms. Yep. Coinbase in accounting terms. Coinbase is like QuickBooks. So when somebody tells you they have a Coinbase account, they could have a Coinbase Prime account. They could have a Coinbase Exchange account. They could have a Coinbase Commerce account. They could have a, just like QuickBooks, could have a QuickBooks Enterprise account, yeah. a QuickBooks Online Advanced account, right. a QuickBooks Online Essentials, a Simple Start. Like So this is not... I'm not going to learn this overnight. There's a lot of complexities going on in, in this. Well, there, there are more versions of Coinbase than QuickBooks. I will say that. All right. So then, okay. So we'll talk a little tax, we'll talk a little accounting. What, uh, what did we not talk? You mentioned the economics of this. Is there things we need to discuss on that end? Oh, if you want. We can I always do. talk about that. Everybody's like, should I buy it? Should I buy right. it? Right. Right. It seems very volatile. So uh, the only... Thing that I've been able to tell people that I could say with confidence is that I talked to some, because I get this question all the time. Should I buy crypto? Should I buy crypto? So what I did to answer that question, because I was tired of getting asked it, I went to like really good wealth managers, right? Mm -hmm. And they said, you know, what we tell our clients for assets that are this volatile, it's okay to put in between 0.5 and 1% of your net worth, this is like if you're crazy aggressive, it's 1%. So between 0.5 and 1% of your net worth in assets like this. So it'd be like, they consider this like angel investments, cryptocurrency, like highly volatile swinging things. They're alike. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's my best advice to people. When wealth managers say, if you consider this an investment, I've gone so far as to call it an asset class, but not an investment because it's like, because not all of them are investments, right? Right, like, right. So if you consider it an investment, a really sophisticated good wealth manager would say half a percent to 1% of your net worth is your ceiling. So, and if you're just an average everyday person, my advice to them is however much your limit at Vegas is should be your limit in crypto. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, I'm apparently super aggressive then. Um, I don't have a ton, but it's a, a decent amount. My, my son would be considered ultra aggressive, I guess. Yes, he would. He would. Uh, so uh, in this. Um, all right. So that actually helps me. I got a couple of questions on top of that. And then I want to get into a, a scenario you and I talked about at the beginning and you kind of mentioned the gusto a little bit with payroll. So we'll, we'll save that to the end because I'm, I'm curious about this. But in addition, so my son's probably going to be like, dad, stop talking about me. Um, he, he's a validator. 
do you know what that is? Uh, you know, he set up a computer that validates transactions what for, I think, Ethereum. Ethereum, I think. Okay. Yeah. So the way several of the major chains work, Ethereum, Bitcoin, is that somebody has to authenticate that you had what you had and that you're sending it to somebody else. So typically, a transaction isn't considered like a protocol that you have to have from a business perspective on when you receive payment. It's like, did it clear the bank after three days for cash? Typically, people say, does it have 20 validations? So there's people like your son confirming like the actual cryptocurrency or the amount in their account that they say are enough to cover the transactions and that they use the right, what they call private key, which is like a password to authorize the transfer. And what most people say is once 20 of those validations occur, they feel like they have the money. Okay. And so if you deposit money in Coinbase, for example, you will see that it's not available to you immediately because it's waiting for those validations. And Coinbase is probably like 60 validations. So there, there need 60 of your son's stuff to do it. So validation, and it's very similar to mining, Mining also creates new cryptocurrency in Bitcoin. So it's like- Yeah, I don't understand that either. (laughs) Well, why they call it blockchain is like the validation is the creation of the new block. And the new block, all it does is say what the, who the new owner is. Okay. So they they talked about using cryptocurrency uh, for title insurance. Because if you think of how your thing passes, like that discrete unit would then pass and the new block would be the ownership change. Okay. And you would have a chain and you could always you could see the whole history of title mm-hmm. for like properties. Then you're like, well, what happens if it subdivides and stuff like that? Then you would just have partial units that you would have to track and stuff like that. So it, it, all, right. all kinds of crazy problems. So all right, as long as we're talking about that, what's an NFT? An NFT is stands for non-fungible token. But my analogy for NFT <laughs> is uh, if you want to buy an NFT, you're this like that's the equivalent of paying for a mural in your community, right? Okay. Because right now I don't I haven't seen very many places where you can monetize it. So you're like, okay, at the local park, there's a wall, and we're gonna pay for a mural. If you're the kind of person that would pay for that mural, you're the kind of person that it's okay, I would advise to buy NFTs. Because it's just okay. kind of a public thing out there. But um an NFT can be a lot of things. Uh, the the use case that people talk about most is some kind of art or like you've seen people do snapshots of tweets and stuff like that. I was reading today, like one of the t- tweets that's the, re- the first tweet ever, like one time sold for $18 million or something. I can't remember, 80 million or something. Yeah. It doesn't even matter. Well, the other day, it, the highest bid for it was $240. So that just like supports my... Um, not 240 million, 240 dollars total. Okay. Okay. So, so, so an NFT great investment. is similar to that. So it's um, there are some great platforms out there that uh, artists are using to monetize their artwork, and a second place where they can do their artwork. And then some of the platforms I'm seeing are able to display NFTs, and that could potentially lead to monetization for the users of those people. Like that, like there could be some value to owning it. But right now, it's so new. Right there, there's no there's no monetization strategy. So you're just kind of buying the mural <laughs> that can't be yours really because everybody else can see it still. Cause it's public on most of these things. So, yeah. Well, somebody I work with uh, was in Seattle last week and there's like an NFT museum there now or something. Have you heard that? I, I haven't have no been idea. to the NFT museum. I'm not surprised. Now a use for a non-fungible token could be the title of insurance thing. Okay. So you could say, yep, the non-fungible token you get represents the title for the property you live on. So it's non-fungible means it's not changed. It's unique. It doesn't change and you own it. So like we could, that could be a record uh, for that. So one of our um, not-for-profit clients is using NFTs as a charity receipt, basically. Like you knew how you used to get a, like, who was it that had the starving kids of Africa commercial and you could send a dollar and you get yes. a picture of a kid. Remember that yeah. commercial yep. run? Well, you can do the same thing now as a not-for-profit. You could say, instead of saying a picture of a kid, you could send an NFT of the kid. Or in this case, this client of ours builds houses and you actually 
buy the NFT and you get the NFT of the house and they build the house for somebody. Okay. Right. Yep. So that's a cool use of an NFT, but that's like a, that's like synthesizing a receipt, right? It could be used like that's being using the NFT as a receipt and not as like a investment. Right. So when people think of NFTs as investments, that's a different thing. Right. So NFT is an investment would, is, would be the tax and accounting side. The other side is just, okay, this is fun or potentially. Yeah, technically it's an asset, but a lot of times I'll, I'll tell people that should be an expense <laughs> because <laughs> of what they're doing. But uh, we bought one, or Kenji bought one. He tried to buy me one and he was unable to. He, he only bought himself one. He, we just did an episode on an RL podcast. But um, sorry for the listeners, Kenji's my business partner, but uh, he bought one from Bud Light Next. Okay. So Bud Light Next issued NFTs and it was like this picture, but it also entitled you to swag or merchandise down the road. So the holder of the NFT, whoever the holder of record is in the future, theoretically is going to get, I don't know, probably just email spam, but right. something in the future. So you could use NFT for that. So they could send him swag or register him for a Super Bowl pass. Like all the NFT holders could go into a lottery and whoever they picked like, so they would have a record of that. So that's an interesting use for that. So corporations are getting into this too. So NFTs are in their early, early stages, but just like cryptos, like whatever they're used for is what they're going to be. Like they could be a receipt <laughs> or they could be a piece of artwork or they could be a mural, you know? Mm. So be careful. They're not all the same thing and they're not all investments for sure. All right. Yeah, well, I was I was just for some reason looking this up yesterday and I was seeing this, you know, Eminem bought this NFT for millions of dollars and some other, you know, celebrity bought this one. And I'm like, oh, I don't get it. Um, yeah, that, that market's in a dip right now. I talked to uh, we have several clients in the space, in the marketplace space. And after Q1, there was a big dip, but that's kind of stabilized. So it's it's not a crazy time to look at them if you're looking at them. Okay. All right, so let's do a, a fun story of something that you've had to deal with accounting or tax wise with the uh, cryptos. Uh, is there any interesting uh, anecdotes or stories you could share? So, uh, yeah, lots. <laughs> uh, well, we talked about that gusto and that dish in my the, mind. The identity theft. Okay. Uh, I had my cell phone stolen by AT&T employees. They were conspiring with bad guys for six times once I lost it. Is it the SIM card swap? Have you heard it? Where they no. take over your cell phone? No. Because they think I'm using my text as my, instead of two-factor authentication, like they think I'm using text instead of like a authenticator op. So I got a SIM card swap uh, six times in a two-year period. Trying once, to get into uh, your wallet or something? Your crypto yeah. wallet? Or, okay. So they would break, they would take over my cell phone and then they would try to break into my emails. And then the one email that I had, which I left vulnerable, I had fake Coinbase and Gemini accounts because I wanted to make sure it was people, that's what they were trying to do. And then they would try to break into that because I could look at their search history when I got it back. So uh, yeah, I, I so now I'm I'm a, I'm a VIP at AT&T and have the office of the president on speed dial. And they have like the people when they read my notes on my account, laugh out loud. Uh, the service people are usually like, let wow. me read some notes. And then 20 minutes later, they're like, ha ha ha. Like, that. but um, so that's kind of the downside of crypto. The yes. other downside of crypto, we were really worried about getting kidnapped because people were assuming that we held a lot of crypto at our clients yeah. and people were getting kidnapped back in 17 and 18. So the way we dealt with that, so like anybody with over a hundred million in treasury is going to have this issue. Our engineers came up with a way to use smart contracts and we haven't talked about smart contracts, but on Ethereum, you can build a computer program, a smart contract. So what we did, we built a cash management strategy. So we split the treasury into eight chunks and we put them on rolling two years locking. So they locked, unlocked each every quarter on a two-year rolling average. We figured we don't need that for two years. So then each each tranche comes unlocked every two years on a staggered basis, these eight tranches. Yeah. And then we decide whether to relock it or not in these smart contracts. And then we were real public about it. So people would try to kidnap us. So, but it was a great <laughs> treasury management solution, right? If you think about it, like it, it, it sends a good message to the market that this is like, you at least have two years of visibility because you can publish the smart contract. They can see where it is. They can track it. Like anybody has a stakeholder in that token can track it. Uh, so that was one of the things I was proudest of. The other fun one was 
when one of my clients said, okay, I want to pay my people in cryptocurrency and they were using Gusto for payroll. And we were like, oh shit, we got to get the W2 right. <laughs> so, so then we were like trying to figure out different ways to hack Gusto to get that into Gusto correctly. And then we had to decide whether we're going to take taxes out net or gross. And then we had to figure out. So we came up with this formula for people that were accepting crypto. And then we figured out, and the punchline is we ended up using the paid by check feature in Gusto and doing special payroll runs for every employee during those payroll runs. So was the employee receiving cash or was the employee receiving crypto as their payment? Crypto. They were, oh, see, I thought the crypto was being converted to cash and then paying the employee. So the, uh-uh. the employee was receiving crypto. Oh, that is confusing. So what we would pay them, what we ended up doing is doing the payroll calculation, paying the employees net in crypto and remitting to Gusto the cash amounts and then tricking Gusto to thinking we wrote a check to the people. <laughs> so, so by doing the paid by check, don't take it out of our account. And then Gusto would only take out the cash fiat from the company's thing. And we would remit it because we didn't want to get, we, I'd been, I lived through the stock option days where people got busted, where they had all these taxes that they owed. Yep. So I was like, I'm just, I was just committed to like, they're going to get these net attacks. So if they go to zero, they've already paid the tax. They're not going to be hurt. Right. Like, right. So, so we did that for all their employees. And then, then it just became a tracking nightmare for those people. Right. Their basis was in their pay stubs though. Okay. That's what I decided was the best thing to do. So they have their pay stubs and they could bring their pay stubs and do that. And then that was their lot tracking. So the, when they got paid then, did they have like their own wallet that they would go to or how would, yeah. Is that what you would do? Yeah. Okay. That's exactly what you do is, uh, and then you had to make sure that they were checking it because you'd have people come back later and be like, well, I thought I set this up right and I didn't have my password. And we're like, dude, you're screwed. <laughs> Cause like, like in crypto, like if you lose your password, if you're custing it yourself, you're like, there's no help desk guys. Right. Like it's not, if you put it in Coinbase, you have this counterparty risk. Like, like what happened? Why most of us don't custody in Coinbase or places like that is early on exchanges, would go out of business. Yep. They don't have any regulations. No, like they don't have to keep your crypto. They can go, do just like banks lend it or do whatever there's just it's wild wild west so yep. exchanges went down all the time so most of us like the old school people the people back in 16 17 18 we self custody we call it but mm-hmm. if you self custody if you lose your password yeah. you're like that guy in england that's trying to dig up a dump for trying to fight figure out where the half billion dollars is right yeah oh that's a that, that, yeah i don't that i would not feel comfortable <laughs> with uh, forgetting my password. I, I bang my head and my password's gone. <laughs> now I lost. I have a great white paper on it for corporations and there's a way to do it. We, yeah. We, yeah. We, there's because well, we'll, you write down your recovery password for most of the devices you use. It's like a 20 word string usually. And we have people put them in their safety deposit boxes and stuff like that. Right. And, okay. And I know there's like even these metal things that you can not engrave it in, but punch it in or something oh, yeah, as yeah. well. So, uh, so yeah, those are the people that, that have a, don't like paper and you can yep. etch it into the, yeah, that's just the 20 words you can etch it in. They'll pay. Right. Yeah. That they, they have, they have some great. Um, well, why don't you use yeah. an NFT to save your password for your, uh, um, <laughs> well, that the is public, right? public and then anybody can recover your password. <laughs> pretty much owes them. I don't advise that. Not usually. a good, not a good, uh, we uh, have no, in my client that we set up, we had no electronic records. None of the passwords are in any digital format saved anywhere. So they're all old school saved somewhere wow. in safety deposit boxes that yep. we don't even have a record of who has what and what safety deposit box. Is this going to change at some point? Are we going to have more security around this that we don't have to worry about that? Well, we already do. You have, um, see, Coinbase is in a different place than it was in 2017, right? Yep. Like Coinbase has some insurance on some of your products. Like it's it's getting closer to kind of bank regulations. Gemini okay. is the same way. Okay. So like average users can just have a Coinbase account or a Gemini account. I, I would say if you have less than a hundred grand in crypto, like you, there's no real need to self custody at this point. I used to tell people it's ten grand several mm-hmm. several years ago. I'm kind of up to a hundred grand now. Right. You know, if you have a million dollars, like I would probably self custody it. But like, yep. 
hundred grand or less, like uh, you could use Gemini or Coinbase. It's just a fine, those are fine solutions in the U S right now. Okay. All right. All right. Well, any, any final thoughts on the crypto discussion before I ask you one last question? Yeah. Don't be scared of it. Yeah. Come on, man. <laughs> Tell the accountants everywhere. Like let's not be scared. Let's be on the cutting edge. It's fun. Like it's, it's not boring. Yeah. So, yeah, it's you definitely in, in tax and accounting, you have to know what's going on because it's not going away. And so don't be scared. It's not going away. All right. Final question. This is like what the uh, Je- what's the, the final Jeopardy round? Uh, final Jeopardy. Final round. Jeopardy. All right. So we talked all this stuff. You helped me a lot. Crypto. I still am confused. I think a lot of people are confused, but you I have more understanding right now than I did 50 minutes ago or whenever we started. So I appreciate that. The one question I have, nothing to do with crypto now, because you are not Mr. Crypto. That's not the only thing you do. Give me an idea of what you do outside of uh, work and crypto. What's your passions? What do you have fun doing? Uh, The most random thing that people find entertaining is that I own 11 chickens. I decided to be a chicken (laughs) farmer during COVID. And I built a chicken coop with 11 chickens in my side yard so that the kids and the neighbors could come see. And then I have eggs for the whole neighborhood now. Right. So that's the most random thing I would tell you. Okay. But uh, probably the most interesting. All right. All right. What you don't have neighbors, because I've heard this story before where neighbors are not happy with the sounds coming out of the chicken coop. You're OK with it? Well, the roosters, we, we agreed. We, we got rid of the roosters as soon as we identified them when they grew up. And then um, the only bad thing, we, we did have a fly, the fly issue of 2021. Okay. <laughs> And, uh, you know, if you, if you have a fly issue, it's like three weeks to recover. Oh, really? Uh, but, uh, we have it under control now. I made my mistake. Yep. One of the neighbors paid the price and I'm forever apologetic to <laughs> oh, them about that. The, the but, great uh, fly infestation of 2021, huh? Yeah. Right. It was a three weeks of hell for one of the neighbors. All right. And, uh, yeah. All right. But overall. Everybody's happy with the, the t- overall. I, rec- I recommend chickens. It's nice and therapeutic. All right. All right. So, so you're, you're Mr. Crypto and Mr. Chicken. We got two titles for you now. So there you go. All right. Well, I appreciate you being on. This was great. I think everybody's going to enjoy it. Uh, um, and uh, so if anybody wants to find out more about you or crypto help or anything, how do they get a hold of you? Well, uh, connect with me on Twitter or LinkedIn. I'm the tech CPA on both on all the social medias, the tech CPA. It's pretty easy. Uh, if you want to go to our, uh, I have a blog series in uh, our resources on crypto and on the acuity blog and acuity is just acuity.co. Come and check that out. And then if you want to hear my ramblings with Kenji on the other podcast, drink while you think is uh, our podcast and then YouTube series over there. And we'd love to have more listeners we have we have 12 listeners now so oh wow so we're trying to get up into the 20s nice so that'd be awesome that, that's great and and uh, uh rumor has it i'm going to be able to be on drink with while well, you think with you guys i'm looking forward to that yes we're going to talk craft brewing yep uh, i'm, you, I'm actually going to so. i'm sending you some beers to, for that episode so okay well i'm porter and stout and he's ipa so right. just so you know yeah like we, if, if, if i could put a request in i'm i'm a stout drinker and I never get Everybody always sends the IPAs and Kenji's like, this is awesome. I'm like, this sucks. <laughs> well, I, I am doing it both. Are you a, a are you a, any kind of stout? Are you a, a pastry stout? Do you like the hit, thick, heavy, sweet ones? or I like the heavy, sweet ones. All right. So I know uh, what to but do. I'm, 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 I'm pretty unassuming with any of the stouts. I like trying all the stouts, but uh, the pastry stout is a good, is, is a good solid, you know, good safe bet. All right. Me. So now we know three things, the crypto, the chickens, and you like stouts. So we're, yeah. we're good. All right. All right, Matthew. Well, thank you again for being on. I really appreciate this. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thank you for joining us today on the Unique CPA. You can find all the links and show notes for today's episode, as well as more about TriMerit at theuniquecpa.com. Remember to subscribe and join us for our next episode where we'll be going beyond compliance into forging new pathways of delivering value to your clients, diversifying your revenue streams, and leading edge management techniques and styles.